Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Sustainable Consultant Scope of Services and Guide for Sustainable Projects webinar brought to you by AIA Contract Documents. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, there's a few administrative items. Uh, please note that this presentation will be recorded and the recording and PowerPoint along with the brief survey will be emailed to you uh, by the end of today. This course is also eligible for one AIA HSW learning unit. When you registered for this course, you entered your AIA member ID if applicable. We'll use that information to report your credit directly to the AIA. During the course of today's presentation, please use the chat or question feature on your GoToWebinar box to ask any questions, and time permitting, at the end of the webinar, we'll answer as many questions as we can. And with no further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over now to one of our presenters, my colleague, Colleen Telling. Colleen? Thank you very much, Hosti. And welcome everyone to today's webinar about the AIA sustainability documents just released this month. We're very happy that you can join us. So just a couple housekeep housekeeping items to cover. Um, our presentation today is protected by copyright laws. So we ask that you not reproduce any portion of this material. And as Hosti mentioned, the program does qualify for continuing education units. Um, and any statements made by us uh, do reflect our own views and not those of the AIA. Uh, just one disclaimer to let you know about. Um, none of the information provided today should be construed as legal advice. Um, it is meant for informational purposes only, and no attorney-client relationship is established today. Um, your speakers today will be Tara Myers, who is an architect and principal at ESA in Nashville, Tennessee. Tara is on our documents committee and was one was the chair of the task group that drafted C204 and updated D503. Um, and I am Colleen Telling. I'm an attorney at AIA uh, working on the contract documents based in Washington, DC. So we'll be covering today the C204, our new scope of services document for uh, consultants providing sustainable services. We're gonna look at how this document relates to the E204 Sustainable Projects Exhibit, as well as C103, uh, the owner consultant agreement without a predefined scope of services. Uh, we'll also cover responsibilities of the Sustainable Projects Consultant, and we will conclude by looking at updates made to the Sustainable Projects Guide. Uh, so again, we're just going to give you a brief overview of our contract documents. Um, we'll step into the E204, C204. Uh, we'll also discuss uh, some important legal considerations on your sustainable projects. And we will also uh, finish by looking at sample sustainability plans. So our contract documents program has a long-standing history. We've been publishing standard form documents since 1888, which is 132 years ago. We created these standard legal forms to make design and construction transactions more predictable. And today, AIA offers nearly 200 agreements and forms. So it makes um, our documents the industry standard, aside from their widespread use, is the volume of case history and legal precedent that's incorporated in the documents. Uh, with each revision, the design, construction, and legal professions um, evaluate new or revised language, um, and we adapt it as best practices to the industry. 
Um, the documents have been drafted to represent each party's interest equally. And much of the contract language is about allocating risk to the party who's best able to manage and control that risk. Um, and with each iteration, we are seeking improvement. Uh, the process begins with collecting and analyzing input from uh, many sources. Uh, the process of drafting, reviewing, and revising leads to a final version that is approved by our documents committee. Uh, so if you've been wondering who the participants are in this drafting process, uh, we have them listed here. Um, each of these groups plays an important role in the development of the documents. Uh, market research is done early on to validate issues and topics that are important to the industry. We also work with industry stakeholders, um, other AIA groups, uh, liaisons, and subject matter experts for additional knowledge and feedback. Uh, but the heavy lifting of writing and revising the documents is performed by the AIA Contract Documents Committee members, uh, along with assistance from the AIA staff. Now, the Documents Committee is a diverse group of volunteers from all across the country. They represent owners, architects, contractors, insurers, and outside legal counsel. The Documents Committee volunteers serve for a 10-year term, which coincides with the 10-year cycle in which we revise our documents. So oftentimes, uh, users of our documents wonder what these numbers in front of the titles actually mean. Uh, you may have seen them and looked right past them, uh, just focusing on the document title but I'm gonna give you just a brief explanation of the meaning of those. So for our example, we'll use uh, today's document C204. Uh, each of these numbers represents an aspect of the document, which we will break down. Uh, one way that the documents are grouped is by series, uh, which is represented by a letter. So A would, represent owner-contractor agreements, B, owner-architect, and in our case here, uh, C, other agreements, signifies that this is an owner-consultant agreement. Next, we have the type of document. Uh, prime agreements uh, would be represented by one, for instance, a C103. In this case, uh, for our scope document, the type is number two. The third placeholder has to do with the project delivery method. Um, and zero represents that this is a conventional document, part of the design bid build family. If there are multiple documents that fall under the same series type, and delivery model. This will be indicated by sequential numbers. Uh, so we currently have C201, 2, and 3 uh, in our suite of documents. And uh, that's why this sustainable consultant scope was numbered 4. Lastly, we have the addition of the document. Uh, here, 2020. And the addition always signifies the year that the document was released. There will be four slides in this presentation with statistics about sustainability. So see how this data compares to your own experience. Um, our first question here, carbon produced by buildings accounts for what percentage of greenhouse gases in the United States? And if you answered B, 40%, you would be correct. Uh, buildings produce emissions of all kinds, of course, not just carbon. Um, for instance, in Chicago, buildings generate about 
53% of the city's emissions uh, compared to Boston, where buildings generate 75% of the city's emissions. And here is AIA's view of the present state of climate change, uh, which is a call to action for architects to assist in improving the built environment. Uh, so certainly climate change is on a lot of people's radar um, as it affects every person, every project and client um, in a number of ways. So this is uh, a driving force behind AIA's sustainability initiative. And now I would like to turn the presentation over to Tara, who will talk about the E204 Sustainable Projects Exhibit. All right, thank you. and welcome everyone. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen now. We've got technology turned over here. So before we discuss the new C204 Sustainable Consultant Scope, I think it probably be helpful to understand the E204 Sustainable Projects Exhibit, which was used as a guiding document in the creation of the C204. The E204 is an optional exhibit that can be used in conjunction with the AIA's conventional A201 family of design, bid, build, owner architect, and owner contractor agreements. And if you're familiar with those agreements, you may have seen that they contain a checkbox in the last article that lists the documents comprising the agreement. And this is where you can select the E204 box if it applies to your project. So as a lead into understanding the E204, let's cover a quick history of how AIA contract documents have addressed sustainable design. Starting back in 2007, there was a very short clause in the B101 addressing sustainability in the project. And it basically said that the architect should consider environmentally responsible design alternatives. And it gave you the option to add more extensive sustainability services as additional services. Because of the increase in the number and scope of sustainable projects, the D503 Sustainable Projects Guide was developed in 2011. It discussed the concepts regarding the relationship of how project agreements could be modified to reflect the relative risks and rewards that are unique to the way sustainable projects are designed, constructed, and operated. And the guide included model language that could be inserted into AIA standard agreements and still have a coordinated set of contracts. It also provided an education component that discussed items such as certification systems. So now moving ahead to 2012, the concepts and clauses in the guide were actually incorporated into the flagship A201 family agreements and issued as the full family of SP or sustainable project documents. And then in 2017, with the latest updates to the A201 family, the documents committee took a slightly different approach. The contracts, contract issues that should be addressed for sustainable projects are now included in one optional exhibit that can be attached to each agreement for the project, and that's the E204. By making it an exhibit, the language is all now in one place rather than covered independently in each separate agreement. When the language was in separate documents, it was possible to make edits or changes in only one document and lose that coordination between the full family of documents. So by placing all the language in a single exhibit, all project participants now see the same language in the same way and it is applied universally. So we've got a diagram here to show you the relationships between all the parties and the AI contracts that would be used on a traditional design bid build project. And as you can see, the H201 general conditions, while this is a document that I think you traditionally see attached to the owner contractor agreement, it's also the document that governs the relationship between the owner, the architect and the contractor on the project. So in order to define the sustainability roles and responsibilities of each party, the architect and the owner would execute a B101 owner architect agreement. And, and as well, they would execute an E204 sustainable projects exhibit. The E204 would also attach and flow to, down to any consultants on the architect through their C401 contract, which would be the owner, <clears throat> excuse me, the C401 architect consultant agreements. In turn, then the owner and the contractor would utilize an AIA A101 and the same E204 exhibit would attach to that agreement. 
So that way, the E204 would then flow down to all the subcontractors through their A401 subcontractor agreements. So the sustainable project exhibit contains a process by which the parties work to achieve the owner's sustainability goals and also address the legal risks of the project by utilizing all the items highlighted on this slide. So we have special definitions which have been created to define certain aspects of sustainable design and construction. And in addition, there are provisions that are included that allocate the roles, responsibilities, and risks encountered on sustainable projects. And these are allocated to the project participant that is in the best position to perform or assume that role, responsibility, or risk. The architect's overall role and scope in the sustainability process is also defined. And as well, there are provisions regarding special issues relative to the owner, architect, and contractor. So because the process of sustainable design is so unique, the exhibit includes several definitions for terms that are used frequently throughout the E204. And these terms are necessary for this special set of project parameters. We will dive into greater detail for each of these definitions in the coming slides. As you can see here, the sustainable objective is defined as the owner's goal of incorporating sustainable measures into the design or construction of the project to achieve a sustainability certificate or other benefit to the environment, enhance the health and well being of the building occupants, or improve energy efficiency. The sustainable objective may or may not include seeking a specific type of certification. If you are familiar with the uh, 2017 version of the B101, the owner architect agreement, this has a new fill point in the initial information section for the owner and architect to identify the sustainable objective if one exists for a project. In turn, a sustainable measure is then a specific item that must be completed by each party in order to achieve the sustainable objective. And then moving forward, you have the sustainability plan, which is a document prepared by the architect showing the allocation of sustainable measures to each party. The owner, architect, and contractor all have responsibility for certain sustainable measures, which are allocated to each of them in the sustainability plan. So the final three definitions on this slide relate to the achievement of a certification. Sustainability certification itself is a term that refers to a specific certification such as LEED or a certification required by code. Sustainability documentation is documentation required by the owner or certifying authority to document compliance or achievement of a sustainable measure. And the certifying authority is the entity that is responsible for granting or denying a sustainability certification. For example, this could be the Green Building Certification Institute, the GBCI, responsible for certifying lead or well building projects, or it could be a local jurisdiction having authority over a project. Now, here's a list of the major additions to the architect scope that's added in the E204. In order to highlight the idea that communication is key, the E204 requires that the architect conduct a sustainability workshop with the owner and the project team to discuss the owner's sustainability goals and objectives. And these could include design, construction, or operational elements, aka sustainable measures, that are necessary to achieve the sustainable objective, as well as allocation of responsibility as to which party is in the best position to perform the sustainable measures. So ideally, this takes place before conclusion of the schematic design phase. During the workshop, the participants establish the sustainable objective if one does not already exist, they discuss potential sustainable measures and strategies for their implementation and discuss the potential impact of the sustainable measures on the project schedule, the owner's program, and the owner's budget for the cost of work. The result of this workshop, or what may even be a series of workshops, is the development of a sustainability plan. As mentioned before, the, sustain the sustainability plan is based on the sustainable objective and targeted sustainable measures. It's important to note that the sustainability plan after approval by the owner is incorporated into the owner architect and owner contractor agreements as a contract document. The architect then prepares the SDs, DDs, and CDs that incorporate the sustainable measures identified in the sustainability plan. And then during the construction phase, the architect's services include attention to how sustainable measures are being constructed and achieved and review of proposed changes in the work and their potential impact on sustainable measures and the sustainable objective. If a certification is part of the objective, the architect registers the project, collects the required sustainability documentation, and submits it to the certifying authority. 
So now that we've covered the basics of the E204, it's time to take a break for our second sustainability fact. And these, these stats that you see on the screen are from the 2018 Dodge Data and Analytics Survey, and where they reported the top triggers driving future green building. As you can see from the slide, all three of the top three responses were fairly evenly represented. The number one factor leading the responses was client demands, which just beat out the second response of environmental regulations by 1%. And coming in at number three was the desire for healthier buildings. So as our clients and the authorities having jurisdiction over our projects continue to push for sustainable design, this further emphasizes the need for contracts that address how all of the parties will contribute to the process of designing and constructing sustainable buildings. At this point, we'll turn our focus from the E204 over to the new C204 Sustainable Consultant Scope of Services document. So you may be asking, when might you use, when might you use the new C204 agreement? As um, the AIA documents task group, we were discussing this and we, we met with a lot of interview parties. We interviewed several outside groups that were performing sustainability consultant services on projects. And many of these were architects who were not the architect of record for the project, or they were consulting engineers or others serving in non-architect roles. Therefore, we felt that the contract documents needed to provide an alternate means for the owner to hire an independent consultant to provide assistance with the sustainability process. This dedicated sustainability consultant would act as a facilitator or clerk of the works who implements the many stages of the sustainability process. This leaves the architect of record free to focus on the design and incorporating sustainable features into the project rather than organizing and tracking all of the submittals and for the required that are required by certifying authorities. So we've updated the diagram that we showed, showed you earlier and to explain how the sustainability consultant fits into the overall contractual team relationship. As a consultant to the owner, the sustainability consultant will contract with the owner using a C103 standard owner consultant agreement without a predefined scope of services which defines the more general terms and conditions of their relationship, such as ownership of documents, termination, and payment provisions. The C204 will then attach to that agreement and define the specific sustainability scope and role that the consultant plays on the project. And then the other parties will still execute an E204 sustainable projects exhibit to define the roles of the owner, architect, and contractor in the sustainability process. So what should you know about the C204? Well, it can be used on any type of a sustainability project, such as those seeking a certification for LEED or well building, as well as those who have a sustainable objective but are not seeking a specific certification. And similar to the E204, the C204 provides a roadmap to integrate sustainability into design and construction projects. As we saw in the contract relationship diagram, it is not a standalone agreement and it is only a scope document and therefore it must be paired with a C103 2015 standard form of agreement between owner and consultant without a predefined scope of consultant services. C204 must also integrate and work hand in hand with the E204 and therefore it uses the same definitions as those we reviewed for the E204, such as sustainable objective, sustainable measure and sustainability plan. The C204 scope of services recognizes that in a typical owner architect agreement, such as if you have a B101, where the parties identify a sustainable objective, the owner and architect will complete the E204 sustainable projects exhibit, and C204 has the consultant taking on some of the roles of the architect record that they typically provide in the E204. So as such, it is necessary for the owner to modify the architect services in the E204 to eliminate overlap with the sustainability consultant scope. So having said that, what are the consultant's responsibility under the C204? As we discussed earlier, the sustainability consultant will take on some of the roles previously assumed by the architect of record under the E204. Among its charges, the sustainability consultant will conduct a sustainability workshop with all the stakeholders to discuss the sustainable features on the project. The participants of the workshop would include the owner, architect, and other design team members, as well as the contractor if they are onboarded early in the project. And this is just like in the E204. And as with the E204, the goal of the sustainability workshop is to be able to develop a sustainability plan, and this process is now led by the sustainability consultant. The consultant will also help to allocate the sustainable measures to the project participant based on who is in the best position to perform each measure. 
The, sustainabil the sustainability consultant also gathers information. They coordinate with all the parties. They submit materials to and obtain approvals from the certifying authority. And when that happens, when the owner is pursuing a sustainability certification, and they also handle payment of the associated fees involved with that process. So during procurement, the consultant is responsible for attending the pre-bid conference or selection interviews. They're responsible for reviewing applications applicable questions regarding the bidding or proposal documents, reviewing substitutions, and evaluating bids or proposals that are re related to the sustainability plan. Then during construction, the consultant is responsible for providing advice and recommend recommendations to the owner and the architect in several areas, but only to the extent that these areas relate to the sustainability plan. The consultant will review applicable submittals, assist the owner in reviewing and responding to requests for information by the contractor. They will provide advice and recommendations to the owner and architect about changes in the work and notify the owner of changes that may materially impact the sustainability plan. You're probably noticing that these responsibilities correspond to those of the architect in the E204. So these are the areas in the E204 where the owner would remove these responsibilities from the architect of record freeing them up to focus on design and implementing sustainable features into the project and less on these administrative matters. So one other thing to note about the, um, the C204 is a lot of the language in this document was taken from the E204, but in addition, some of the provisions were brought over to the C204 from another agreement, which is the B214-2012 LEED Certification Services Agreement. And now that the C204 is available and is applicable to multiple rating systems, including LEED, the B214 is beginning its 18-month phase-out this month and will officially retire that document in November 2021. So, similar to the B101 and other AI agreements, the C204 also includes a list of supplemental services which can be provided by the sustainability consultant. On your, on your screen, you'll see an excerpt from the full supplemental services table in C204. The table lists sustainability, sustainability services that are not described elsewhere in C204, but that may be needed for the project. The consultant and owner should discuss this list and complete the table by indicating whether the services will be provided, and if so, by whom. That wraps up the overview on the C204, and at this time, I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Colleen to talk about the key legal considerations when using the C204. Great. Thank you very much, Tara. Um, and now the, the primary legal considerations that we're going to look at are the standard of care, guarantees and warranties, project registration, and procurement and construction phase services. So the standard of care is actually defined in the prime agreement, C103, as opposed to C204, the scope document. Um, this standard is nearly identical to what you would find in the owner architect agreements. As more jurisdictions institute green building standards by code, the standard of care may include requirements established by newly adopted code or practice. Um, and I would note that standard of care is an evolving concept. Um, as design professionals begin incorporating sustainable design practices as part of their basic services, uh, whether that's voluntarily or through jurisdictional requirements, uh, the standard of care may eventually be construed to include sustainable design practices. So guarantees and warranties, uh, these are defined in the C204. Um, and it's very important to recognize that successfully achieving the sustainable objective will depend not only on the design of the project, uh, but also the owner's use and operation of the project, uh, the work or services provided by the architect and the owner's contractors and other consultants, or interpretation of credit requirements by a certifying authority. Uh, so because of this, the consultant is not in a position to guarantee or warrant that the project will achieve the sustainable objective. 
And the language you see here makes it explicit that the consultant is not providing such a guarantee or warranty. So registration fees for projects that are pursuing a sustainability certification can be significant. Um, often owners will request that architects pay these fees as part of project registration. Um, this section 2.7.2 provides that these fees are a reimbursable expense for the sustainability consultant. So consistent with what we have uh, between owners and architects. At the owner's request, uh, the consultant must attend a pre-bid conference or selection interview to answer questions about the bidding or proposal documents relative to the sustainability plan. The consultant is also responsible for providing clarifications and interpretations about the bidding or proposal documents as they relate to the sustainability plan. Um, if substitution requests are allowed during procurement, then the consultant will review proposed substitutions uh, regarding the sustainability plan. And if the owner and architect have questions about information in bids or proposals uh, concerning the sustainability plan, the consultant is also to evaluate that. With respect to submittals, uh, the consultant must review and provide advice and recommendations to the owner and architect uh, about the contractor's shop drawings, product data, uh, and samples, just to verify that they do conform with the sustainability plan. Uh, this review, uh, as Tara noted, does not extend to reviewing submittals for any other purpose, just sustainability. And the same thing holds true for RFIs and changes in the work. If the consultant finds that a proposed change in the work materially impacts the sustainability plan, uh, the consultant is to further investigate the change and make recommendations to the owner and the architect about implementing that requested change. So now we're going to turn to our third sustainability fact. Um, and we ask, what are the most commonly used energy education tools? Uh, the first is ASHRAE at 58% followed by energy modeling software, such as EnergyPro. Um, third, at 46%, are AIA resources, followed by climate analysis software. And uh, in fifth place is the EPA's target finder. And now we're going to turn to revisions um, in the D503 Guide for Sustainable Projects. D503 was last published in 2013. And at that time, the SP versions of agreements like A101, B101, C401 were prevalent. And so the guide focused on those documents. The 2020 guide still discusses roles and responsibilities faced by owners, architects, and contractors uh, who are working on sustainable design and construction projects, but it discusses how sustainability is now weaved into these agreements. So the first change is that the updated D503 provides an in-depth section by section commentary on the reasoning behind each provision in E204 and it no longer comments on those retired sustainable project documents. Each chapter uh, coordinates with the article and section numbers found in E204 uh, and the information there is applies generally across the design build uh, the CMC, 
and CMA families. The D503 also adds commentary on C401 and C402, which are architect consultant agreements, along with the new C204. Besides explaining the roles and responsibilities of the project participants, uh, D503 offers guidance on materials transparency, resilience, environmental product labels, uh, certification systems, and jurisdictional requirements relevant to sustainable projects. In addition to examples of other types of sustainability certification plans, <clears throat> we've included a sample of a completed well certification plan that users can reference when preparing a plan for their own project. So D503 begins by introducing the evolution of sustainability in the AIA contract documents. Um, it began with basic references and requirements for the architect to discuss environmentally responsible design approaches uh, with the owner. Um, and that was only in some of the agreements. By 2011, uh, we had released the D503 guide which discussed legal and contractual issues uh, around sustainable design and construction practices. Uh, it also provided model language uh, that could be incorporated into those existing contracts. In 2012, AIA released sustainable projects or SP versions of key contract documents, uh, such as B101 SP. The SP versions incorporated model language from the D503 2011 version into traditional design bid build documents. A couple of years later, by the end of 2013, AIA released fully coordinated SP versions for each of the key contracts in the design bid build, uh, construction manager as constructor, and construction manager as advisor families. Uh, the same year, the guide was updated from focusing on suggested model language to a detailed description of each new provision in the SP documents. As part of the design build family updates in 2014, uh, AIA published its first standalone sustainability exhibit which is A141 Exhibit C. Uh, with the 2017 documents release, uh, AIA discontinued updating the individual SP agreements and moved those sustainability requirements into one document for the design bid build family, which is E204. And in 2019, we did the same for the CMC and CMA families. One of the additions we made to the guide was including AIA's COAT top 10 measures uh, or framework for design excellence. If you're not familiar with it, uh, the framework provides direction and resources to design for holistic performance on every project. Uh, some of those measures include designing for integration, uh, ecology, water, and wellness. We also added a short section about materials transparency and optimization, uh, both of which are components of various certification systems uh, like LEED and WELL and programs through the Living Future Institute. And we introduced the concepts of resilience and adaptation and provided links to helpful references on these topics. Regarding product labels and certifications, uh, the guide cautions architects about greenwashing, uh, researching and understanding the product, uh, the method for receiving endorsement, as well as understanding the degree of oversight or evaluation uh, that's provided prior to endorsement. Um, 
The guide further discusses uh, certification systems in general terms, uh, as well as the benefits they offer. And it summarizes common sustainability certification systems. So these would include BOMA 360, uh, BREAM, Energy Star, FitWell, Green Globes, uh, Passive House, Stars, just to name a few. Uh, several of these are new additions to the guide due to their increasing popularity. Uh, the guide recognizes that regulations and codes can vary by jurisdiction, and it introduces important new standards. Uh, so for one, ASHRAE standard 209, uh, which is for energy modeling during design, uh, this can be voluntary um, unless a jurisdiction has adopted it as part of its code. Uh, there's IECC, which provides for minimum regulations for energy efficient buildings. Uh, IGCC, which adds green provisions to existing codes uh, like the IBC. Uh, for local codes, there are two examples we provide in the guide um, of jurisdictions that require green building in their local code. Uh, one is Cal Green, um, which is a comprehensive code uh, that was drafted. And the second example is the DC Green Building Act, uh, which is an example of adopting an existing certification system. Finally, building performance standards. Uh, this is a growing trend across many US cities um, that would include New York City, Austin, and Los Angeles. Um, these are adopted by city councils and they apply to certain types of existing buildings over a certain size uh, for the building's entire lifespan. Uh, and there are financial consequences for failing to comply with the standard. So regarding other delivery models, um, in a CMA delivery model, the construction manager has a close cooperation with the owner and the architect during pre-construction and maintains additional responsibilities during construction. As a result, the CMA documents uh, offer a unique opportunity for the CM to assist in developing and implementing a sustainable design and construction program. During pre-construction, uh, the CMA can review the sustainability plan and offer advice on constructability, uh, materials availability, time requirements for procurement, uh, life cycle data, and analyze any cost and schedule impacts. And that uh, would be contained in our E-235 released in 2019. Uh, the CMC delivery model is similar to CMA, but the construction manager is also constructing the project. Um, early involvement of the CMC during design uh, would allow the CMC to provide input on those sustainable measures, uh, assist in developing a sustainability plan, procure items with longer lead times, and provide an overall smooth transition when it's time to begin construction. And like the design bid build and CM documents, uh, the design build family has its own sustainable projects exhibit, a 141 exhibit C. Uh, that exhibit also mirrors the content and organization of E204. And it contains the same requirements of conducting a sustainability workshop, uh, after which it's the design builder who prepares a sustainability plan rather than an architect. The advantage of this is that allocating responsibility for certification credits 
uh, or other sustainable measures can be confirmed with the responsible party early in the design. The fourth and final sustainability fact here, uh, green building systems that are referenced the most, uh, coming in first place at 80% is LEED, followed by the Living Building Challenge, uh, which is tied with WELL at 21%. Uh, then Passive House, Green Globes, Fitwell, and finally the international systems such as Green. Uh, so now I will turn the program back over to Tara for a discussion of sustainability plans. All right. Thank you, Colleen. So as we discussed earlier, it's regardless of whether you have a sustainability consultant or the architect of record leading the charge with the sustainability workshop, the end result is still the creation of a sustainability plan that will outline the goals for the project as well as how the parties intend to reach those goals. The final chapter of the D503 uh, provides a sample sustainability plan showing how it can be adapted for various certification systems and we're going to go ahead and end our presentation with some information about that plan. So on the screen, you'll see an example of the sustainability plan from the D503 guide. These example plans are partial in nature, and that's really because they provide overall guidance on how the plans could be developed, but we weren't able to create a standard plan in its entirety as the wide variety of systems that you use to measure sustainable projects are so diverse that it makes it difficult to develop a universal document. This example, however, should fit for many types of sustainability projects you may encounter when you're working on these types of designs. In this example, the columns running left to right indicate the sustainable measure selected for the project, the point or credit requirements and how each of these items is applicable, indication of the responsible party, and a description of the sustainable measure. So we're gonna dive deeper here into each of these, these columns. And if you're looking at the first column, the item number, is that's really just simply a reference number to put some sort of order to the sustainable measures. As you can see in this example for LEED, the item number designates the prerequisite or credit number that has been assigned for the credit by the USGBC. And in this example, the column labeled sustainable measure would be populated with all of the potential credits available under the particular LEED rating system that you are using. And moving on to the next column, you've got the point or credit requirements, and that's there to assist in the tracking the credits on the project using a sustainability certification system. So in this example, the available credits would include the maximum achievable point value for each item in the lead checklist. And if you've got a prerequisite credit, those are shown here with the letter Y, indicating yes, it will be achieved. And moving on, you've got the expected column, which would include those credits that you expect to achieve on a project. We've got the rejected column, which includes all of those credits that you do not intend to pursue or cannot achieve, and then contingent, which are essentially those maybes, those credits that you might pursue or you might achieve. The next column is for the responsible party, and it allows you to indicate the project participant who is responsible for, for performing the sustainable measure. In this example, the letter P indicates that the designated entity is the primary responsible party, and the letter S indicates that the party is providing support to the primary party. And then the final column, the sustainable measure description, this area allows you to describe what is necessary to achieve the sustainable measure. So this would include things such as the implementation strategies, specific details about design reviews, testing or metrics required to verify achievement of the sustainable measure and the sustainable documentation that will be required to achieve the credit. So by way of example, for LEED, this last column might simply reference the LEED reference guide for the selected credit. So the D503 guide contains a sample table completed using the LEED certification system, and that's what you're seeing here on the screen. When completing the table for a program like LEED, the table should be completed with all the points or credits available under the particular LEED checklist that applies to your project. 
As described in the previous slide, you will then track the status of each credit, who is responsible for taking lead on that credit, and any notes relevant to the credit. We also have other sample plans in the guide, and this one you're seeing here is for the IGCC, the International Green Construction Code. And this takes on a little bit different spin than, um, than on LEED or some of the systems where you are actually have options for which credits you're going to pursue. So the sustainable measures column in this example is replaced by um, what we're now calling the status of code mandated measure. This change was made because the requirements of the IGC, like other codes, are mandatory and are not subject to the parties deciding which ones they want to pursue. You could also modify the table to indicate when a requirement of the code has been achieved. There are other sample plans included in the D503, as well as other example documents that show how these charts can be combined with additional language that ties back to the contract with the owner and can be used for obtaining the owner's approval and sign off on the plan. So we hope that you will find these examples and all the other information included in the D503 helpful as you work on your contracts for your next sustainability project. That wraps up our discussion on the D503. And at this point, I'm going to turn the slides back over to Hosti to wrap up the presentation. Thank you so much, Tara and Colleen, for a thorough uh, presentation of the documents. We do have a great number of questions that have come in. Before we start with the Q&A portion of the webinar, I just want to remind everyone that this webinar is recorded. It will be emailed to you after the webinar by tomorrow, and the recording will also be placed on our LEARN page at aiacontracts.org backslash LEARN. You'll also find a plethora of on-demand and live training advertised on this page, as well as articles and other resources. If you have any questions about our content after today's webinar, please don't hesitate to contact docinfo at aiacontracts.org or 202-626-7526. And any questions about our online service, any technical support inquiries can be sent to tech support at contracts.org. Lastly, I do want to um, remind attendees that this course is eligible for one AIA HSWLU, and your credit will be reported directly to the AIA within one business week. So with that, let's go ahead and uh, start the Q&A session. So let's start with the first question for today's webinar. Please expand on who might be a sustainability consultant. Colleen, do you want to take that or you want me to grab it? Sure, I can start. Um, uh, the sustainability consultant could be an architect. Um, it could also be a non-architect. So an individual who is well-versed in uh, sustainable features uh, that would be handling a lot of the uh, administrative side of um, obtaining certifications, for instance, uh, which would free up the architect to focus more on uh, its design and incorporating sustainable features into the design of the project. So I'll add to that, from our experience um, in Nashville, which is where our firm is located, we have several engineering firms that take on this role on projects. Um, we also have several standalone companies that this is what they do for a living is they manage sustainability projects for owners. So um, I think in our case, we, we see that this could be a wide variety of people that would take on this role, or it could just be another architect that maybe they're not the architect of record, um, but they are serving as the sustainability guide moving through this process. How are documents used if the sustainability consultant is contracted directly to the architect, not the owner, to complete the E204 services? In that case, you would probably uh, be working under a C401 or C402 agreement um, if you're employed directly by the architect uh, rather than employed directly by the owner. Yeah, so um, the, uh, 
go ahead, Colleen, I'm sorry. That's okay. And I was going to say the E204 in the owner architect relationship would flow down to that architect consultant relationship. And that's exactly what I was going to say. Yes. So you would still have your B, the owner and the architect would do a B101, and then the architect would hire this sustainability consultant using a consultant agreement, probably the C401, and they would flow down those roles. Yes. So another follow-up questions. We do have a few questions regarding what a sustainability consultant is. This follow-up is, what is the profession of the sustainability consultant? Do they carry insurance or can they even obtain insurance? So from my experience, the, cons the sustainability consultants we have used um, do carry professional liability insurance. Um, several of them are engineers. So that's, I guess, explains why they can get that type of insurance. But I do think you would want your sustainability consultant to to carry the insurance limits, just like your other consultants on the project. Is the E204 the only AIA contract that addresses resilience and or disaster management and hazard mitigation? The question was, is the E204 the only document that addresses that? Yes. Um, so the the core content uh, that's presented in E204 uh, would also carry uh, into our other sustainable projects exhibits. Uh, so the E234 and 235 for the CM family, um, as well as A141 in design build, that would all be consistent. Have the C204 slash C103 uh, been recognized, coordinated with the IPD project delivery contract documents? No, not at this time. IPD is um, still separate from uh, what would be the traditional design bid build uh, sustainable project documents. Can sustainability consultants use the C204 to contract to the architect rather than the owner? No, I think we answered that one earlier. You would you would be using a C401 versus this because all of the roles would be assigned to the architect under the E204 and they would just be passing those down to the consultant. Sustainability consultants are often not involved in the selection of materials, nor are they involved in the development or management of construction budget. How can the responsibility of the sustainable sustainability consultant reviewing submittals fit in with this? So as far as um, those materials and other items relate to the sustainability plan, uh, this C204 sustainability consultant would be responsible for uh, reviewing to that extent. Yeah, I think the goal is that we really just want that sustainability consultant to help make sure that the plan is being followed. So their role in reviewing the submittals would be to reviewing if there's any way that that material impacts the plan to make sure that that if there's an issue that they can get the architect or whoever specified the material to address it. Is the E204 capable of covering additional MEP commissioning services? I believe that's in that supplemental services chart. I will have to verify that, but I believe that is something that's in that supplemental services chart or it could be added. It could be a write-in by whoever's um, initiating the contract. Is this for new construction or is it used on renovations? It could be used on new construction and renovations. It's not limited to one type of project. What are typical fees for this service? I have, I don't know that that's a question we can answer here. Um, that yeah. is not, yeah, that's a, a, we don't get into fees with AI and I think B, they're across the board depending on what services this consultant is actually providing. 
And we have time for one more question. Are these sustainable objectives different from mandatory sustainable checklists required by local governments? You, if you have a, a local government uh, requiring certain sustainable checklists, that could certainly serve as your sustainable objective to the project. Um, the sustainable objective could be expanded to include things beyond just those local requirements. Um, so it, it, the sustainable objective is meant to serve a, a broad purpose that would encompass uh, something at the local level. So with that, I want to thank our presenters for an informative and interesting presentation today. Thank you to all the attendees for your interest. And again, uh, just a reminder that the recording will be on aiacontracts.org slash learn. And if you have any questions that we couldn't answer today, please direct them to docinfo at aiacontracts.org. Again, thank you all and have a great afternoon.